Oh, the tiring game we play. Not taking the bait. That damn skunk knocking these buckets off. That's the problem with these style of buckets. Very convenient. But they learn to take the corks out because it's very easy. And they let the bees rob the syrup and then they come and they feast on the bees dipped in the syrup. So it's a nice little tasty sugary snack for them. Makes a mess for me. Little bastards. You better not make a mistake. <clears throat> So this is my bulk bee split yard, and I can't say enough about the progress of this yard. What do we have here? It's a little cluster of bees. It's 10 degrees this morning. Ouch. Ouch, ouch, ouch. cooling down quite nicely. Look at that. It's perfect little winter clusters. This is a neat little trick. It's not new by any stretch of the imagination. It's new to me of adopting this practice and I'm probably going to do more of this in the years ahead. We just need to be able to get our timing right. And it was kind of the method was in a way grandfathered by Lloyd Harris. He's a researcher up here in Manitoba. And he is the godfather of the understanding of honeybee longevity. He's the guy that spearheaded this study back in the 70s which tracked the colony, to track the bees within the colony, and the age of bees throughout the entire year. You know, he, he and his crew went through, in every 10 day cohort, I believe, they painted a new subset of bees and counted every subset of bees every 10 days all the way through the year. And by doing that, they're able to track the age of the bee throughout the entire year and then put together this huge data set, just a monster data set, which then was translated into information that can provide us modeling to predict uh, the age of the bee throughout the year. Absolutely fundamental to what we do as beekeepers is as we're trying to manage our bees throughout the seasons. Understanding how the bees react. There we go. Understanding their behavior understanding how they transition themselves throughout the season is absolutely fundamental and critical to how we manage our colonies. And I base everything I do, everything I do, on Lloyd Harris's work. Randy Oliver took his work and put it into a nice sexy little graph and wrote countless articles about it just to help us understand honeybee longevity and behavior throughout the seasons. Look it up. Do a little bit of research and educate yourself on his work. So it's a little bit cooler right now. It's uh, 11 degrees and there isn't a lot of activity in these colonies. <sighs> Clustered right up which is perfect for this time of year. There isn't a lot of bird going on down in these colonies. So what we have is a winter cluster. And through Lloyd Harris's work, he's determined that these winter bees, I call them winter bees, and that's not really fair to say because it's not exactly like that. Lloyd will tell me, Ian, is, it's not that last emergence of bees end up being the winter bees, but it's not exactly how it is. It's a matter of the inflection period of time 
when those short-lived bees, you know, their die-off rate, the inflection time flatlines them into a long-lived bee. And he shows through his work and through other study that that point of inflection where they turn from short-lived to long-lived bee is directly related to bee flight. In other words, directly related to temperature. So if they're flying, they're dying, right? This cool weather as we're drifting to fall, it's gonna help these bees, in a sense, start that inflection period where they start turning themselves into those long-lived bees, right? The less they're flying, the less active they are, the less they're wearing themselves out. The change of juvenile hormones within their bodies turns them into long-lived bees. So as far as I'm considered, it can stay 11 degrees right to November, you know, it can cool right down to freeze and I can get these bees in and perfect. Because at the inflection point within these clusters will have been met. Those juvenile hormones will be converted over and they'll turn into long-lived bees. What I don't really want to see is hot and sunny weather moving into November because then the bees just wastefully fly their life away. His work shows exactly that. It shows that that inflection period is directly related to temperature. And what we want is these bees to nice and slowly shut down through the fall, quit flying and turn into a long lived bee. So interesting, very interesting. Just these bits of information to help us understand what's going on within our apiary just goes so far and helping us manage our bees, or maybe it helps us manage our bees because we can understand your bees a little bit better. And then of course, me being me, it just gets me thinking overdrive. It's like these bees that we're seeing in the colonies now. <clears throat> Ooh, there's heavy. Those bees, that's, those are the bees that are going to be my winter bees, right? They're already locked in. So what's the difference if I leave them outside or if I bring them inside right now? If that inflection period is directly related to temperature and, you know, related to flight, if that juvenile hormone changes within their body as you become inactive in the fall and if it's beneficial for it to have a cooler fall drift into winter just to help that inflection period set in sooner and more consistently why wouldn't i just move them inside right now and once they have established this kind of this this period of longevity like they're starting to establish it right now they're very slow as far as i understand it Right now, when they're becoming inactive in the fall, those juvenile hormones are changing to provide them into that long-lived state. Why not bring them inside and preserve that and not risk these late fall warm spells, which just get them up and flying again and kind of pull back on that conversion over to that long-lived bee. Almost in a sense, preserving the cluster that I'm seeing right now why wouldn't I do that? Well, one reason is because it takes a shit ton of money to refrigerate a winter shed. I've looked into it and it's roughly like they're saying one ton of refrigeration for 100 bees, 100 hives. So if I have 1,500 colonies, that's 15 tons of refrigerant. That's 80 to $100,000 bill. And my brothers don't quite... Well, I can, it just depends on how you justify it, right? For one thing, it would help me maybe preserve these wintered bees, set more of a uh, consistency into uh, that point of inflection as we go into winter. There's all that, and <clears throat> I can justify it behind that. But it can also justify by bringing these bees in, like let's say next week, on refrigeration. It allows me more of a manage timeline, manage schedule, and not have to wait and wait and wait and wait and then drop the pin 
and bring them in within two days or battle the snow because I didn't get my work done in time. So there's advantages that way. And I just had to gear that conversation at the business table and it probably would be accepted, but that's a lot of money, right? And I'm just talking about the fall time period in the spring, the refrigeration becomes a little more useful too, as it allows us to manage these warm spells, keep them nice and easy. Ouch. I gotta quit doing this. Just keep them steady and consistent and less stress in the spring when I'm fretting and fussing. Oh, well, you gotta love this business because there's so many aspects and characteristics to these bees, to these honeybees and their behavior and the way we can manage these bees throughout the season that just allow us to better understand them, better manage them, capitalize on their behavior. We got guys like Lloyd that just bring a pure fundamental brilliance to the conversation and helping us understand these bees a little bit better. It just makes my job so much more enjoyable. And Lloyd's work, you look at Lloyd's work, there isn't anything else in the world that does the same thing as Lloyd did. Tracking honeybee longevity throughout the entire year. You think that this is a basic principle that beekeepers need to know about. And he's the only one, as far as I'm as far as I understand, I've never seen any other modeling done as Lloyd has to help us understand these bees fundamental work and only he's the only guy in the world if you want a guy to come to your convention a guy that's contributed work research work to our industry that impacts everybody and their understanding of honeybees it's lloyd harris get him in there <laughs> help him understand what's going on as these bees convert themselves into winter He's the most fascinating and frustrating man I've ever met. He can talk to you for hours about research and about the, all these dynamics, but he's talking three levels ahead of you all the time. And it's hard to, you got it, you know, every time I talk to Lloyd, and I talk to him again, I talk to him a third time, every time I talk to him on pretty much the same subject, I grasp another understanding of his concepts he's trying to put, a, put forth just such an interesting man and I appreciate his work.